遇见大师，分享智慧。各位观众朋友们，大家晚上好，感谢您收看本期的 i p a d x Story 栏目，我是主持人王慧。有这样一位科学家，从事科研工作四十多年来，他精力无限，慧能不倦。他与人为善，和蔼可亲。从光子学到超材料，从纳米光学到石墨烯，从微波到电动力学。他均有所涉及，并且都颇有建树。他包揽艾萨克牛顿奖章、美国光学学会马克思波恩奖、国际电气与电子工程师协会纳米技术先锋奖、国际光学工程协会金奖、国际无线电科学联盟范德波尔金质奖章、威廉斯特雷福科学成就奖、加拿大工程学院。国际研究员奖等多项大奖，在二零零六年著名科普杂志《科学美国人》公布的全球五十位科技领袖名单中，他的大名赫然在列。他积极参加各种国际学术活动，是我们熟知的国际光学工程学会、美国光学学会、美国物理学会等八个重要国际学术组织的会士。他就是美国宾夕法尼亚大学奈德·尼盖塔教授。伊盖特教授本科毕业于被誉为伊朗大学之母的德黑兰大学，硕士和博士均毕业于鼎鼎大名的加州理工学院。由于成就卓越 ，2016 年和2017年，他分别荣获了芬兰阿尔托大学、德国斯图加特大学和乌克兰国立技术大学哈尔科夫理工学院荣誉博士学位。他还是美国国家发明家科学院院士。本期我们非常荣幸邀请到应该特教授，通过网络视频采访的形式，来了解他对于超光子学、极端材料平台上重组的工作，以及参与各类学术组织在面对科研难题时如何解决等一系列问题的看法。现在，让我们一起走进 i c a x Story， 遇见大师，分享智慧。Thank you, Professor Ngega, and thank you for accepting our invitation to join this interview. It's really my great honor and pleasure. So okay. let's start our interview. Okay, very good. So you go ahead. Tell me. Okay, your research activities span a broad range of areas, including photonics, metamaterials, electrodynamics, microwaves, nano optics, imaging, and sensing inspired by eyes of animals, etc. So, how are these seemingly unrelated specific subjects related in your work?、Uh, thank you so much. First of all,、uh, uh, thank you very much for your kind invitation to me to participate in this interview.、Uh, it's a pleasure and honor for me to be、uh, here and to participate in this interview. So, to answer your question,、uh, I say that you know I love physics and engineering of waves. Particularly electromagnetic and optical waves, and in my group,、uh, we have been exploring various different material platforms、uh, to manipulate and tailor waves and fields in order to find、uh, new functionalities and novel concepts. And、uh, that's why、uh, my research interests and activities span、uh, various areas, as you listed. So, as you can see.、Uh, All these areas have common threads, which are waves and manipulation of waves, and that's one of the areas that I'm so interested in. This so any areas that involve waves, I get interested in that to see how we can actually come up with interesting functional.、Mm -hmm. Great. And、uh, what does your research mainly focus on now? What is the future trend? Excellent. As I mentioned,、uh, we are very interested in、uh, exploring how the、uh, specialized material, nanomaterials, and different forms of material can help us to uh, uh, get uh, interesting functionalities、uh, from waves. So one of the areas that、uh, we have been very interested in and working on, and on Friday I talk about some of that. 
uh, is the area that the, can metamaterial be used in order to do analog computations? In other words, can we actually do computation as the wave goes through materials? So essentially materials becomes like uh, computing machines, if you will. So uh, and this is, uh, uh, we are very excited about this area because it has several interesting you know, features and uh, potential applications. And other areas uh, uh, is that uh, we have been working extensively over the years is the area of uh, uh, material with near zero index properties. Uh, these will provide a quite a fascinating uh, uh, phenomena in wave physics that can have interesting functionalities, various aspects, including wave-based devices and components, uh, quantum phenomena, uh, thermal radiation properties, and so on. And the reason for that is because if you're dealing with a material with near zero index, uh, uh, refractive index, uh, uh, that in that material, the wavelength would stretch. And as a result, the phase distribution along the entire material becomes, you know, uh, more uniform, and that gives rise to a series of fascinating uh, properties, uh, some of which uh, I will discuss uh, on Friday. In general, we are very interested in the extreme scenarios in light matter interactions. And these extreme scenarios can involve, you know, uh, extreme in uh, degrees of freedom, extreme in processing at the nanoscale, extreme in the material parameters like near zero index properties and so on. Uh, and uh, I'd be more than happy to uh, discuss any specific point of view if uh, you are interested. Great, thank you. And uh, I know that you have started and worked in Iran and the United States, and also you had collaborations with colleagues in Finland, Germany, and Ukraine. So what mm -hmm. are your impressions of the universities or research institutes in these oh. countries? Okay. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Uh, uh, I have had collaboration with uh, many scientists from all over the world. Uh, uh, and uh, as you mentioned, including various uh, different countries. And uh, I found that the research institutions and universities uh, uh, in, in all over the world, uh, they, they're similar uh, to uh, uh, universities uh, in the United States. In many aspects, uh, scientists there are doing world-renowned uh, uh, research. They conduct uh, a lot of fascinating research uh, 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 projects. And uh, as I visit, you know, different uh, countries and different universities, uh, I see that there are a lot of uh, exciting research going on there. And as I mentioned, I've had collaboration uh, with many scientists all over the world. And uh, really, I, uh, uh, this collaboration has led to a lot of exciting research the opportunities and possibilities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And you are the fellow of eight international academic organizations, including the IEEE, SPIE, OSA, APS, etc. So what have you gleaned and learned from your participation in these organizations? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, these technical and scientific organizations you mentioned have been scientific homes for me. You know, as you mentioned in your first question, uh, my research interests and activities have been brought. And as a result, I've been working in several different scientific communities. And uh, uh, when I was a PhD student at Caltech, uh, I started my research career in antennas, uh, electromagnetic scattering radar. And then I expanded the, my interest to other wave-related uh, fields and topics like, you know, photonics, uh, nanophotonics, imaging, sensing, uh, uh, material aspect, uh, wave interaction with materials, uh, optics, and so on. So uh, as a result, I became familiar and become uh, familiar with other communities. So uh, that's one of the reasons that these uh, uh, international academic organizations that you mentioned uh, are scientific homes for me. I have benefited a lot from uh, interaction and collaboration with colleagues uh, in these scientific communities and organizations. Mm, wonderful. And uh, in the process of scientific research, how do you think of uh, innovative research topics and how do you deal with difficulties? So what would you do if you hit a bottleneck and couldn't move forward for a long time? 
Um, see, one of my uh, scientific philosophies is the uh, curiosity-driven research. Yes. You know, in my opinion, uh, you will do innovative research when you follow your scientific passion, your scientific interest, uh, and ask curiosity-driven questions. For example, what if and why not questions? And uh, I can give you several examples in my own research experience mm -hmm. uh, when we ask uh, what if questions, and uh, that led to uh, very interesting findings and discoveries. For example, let me give you an example. Uh, the topic of uh, uh, near zero index uh, uh, platform, and particularly the phenomenon of supercoupling, uh, which I will explain you know, on uh, uh, Friday talk, uh, supercoupling in epsilon near zero media actually started by asking uh, simple questions. Uh, of of uh, this qu the simple question was this: What would happen if we fill the region between two waveguides with uh, epsilon near zero material? It was just a simple question we posed, and uh, at that time without having any application in mind. It was just you know curiosity driven research. Uh -huh. And that led to uh, very interesting findings and, in a sense, uh, created a lot of, you know, research interest, you know, in that aspect of extreme metal material. And uh, now, beautiful aspects, in my opinion, one of the beautiful aspects of scientific research is serendipitous findings, you know, accidental findings. You know, uh, often when you follow certain lines of research, uh, you may accidentally discover something which you had not been looking for before. And that's one of the beautiful aspects of the research. And this happens in uh, curiosity-driven research. Now, you mentioned also in your question for the obstacles and challenges. Yes. Well, this is part of the research process. I mean, uh, research process is by its uh, very, pro uh, I mean, uh, process, it's uh, successes and also obstacles. It's always uh, that, that happens. So, uh, how do we deal, you know, with obstacles and challenges? Well, in my opinion, you need to be patient and try and try and try again. Uh, sometimes when you hit the bottleneck on a project, uh, it would be helpful to work on a different project and then come back to the original project. You know, sometimes this will provide you with opportunities to look at the problem uh, with a fresh mindset, you know, and that then you may see a way to overcome uh, that bottleneck. Also, uh, and this is often happens, changing the mindset and thinking out of the box can be often also very useful in addressing and solving challenges. So challenges are important parts of a uh, research process. And, uh, and that makes it exciting because when you overcome the challenges, you get, you know, the sense of excitement and success uh, after, I mean, uh, confronting the challenges. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, curiosity-driven research. Yeah, that's very important. That's right. That's very yeah. important. Yeah, but uh, uh, have you ever think about it, is the applications of your research? Yeah, the application, obviously, of course, application is very important. And the curiosity-driven research is very important. And I think mm -hmm. these go hand in hand. In other words, you can ask, uh, I mean, uh, what if and why not questions. And when you go into that uh, question, try to find the answer to that, then most likely that would lead to also interesting applications. Sometimes the question starts from the applications. That's true. You know, for example, you have certain obstacle and you would like to resolve that. That also is interest important. You may ask the question, okay, what if I use, you know, this parameter or what if I use that material in order to address this problem? That also is a, uh, is a combination of curiosity-driven research and application-oriented research. Thank you. Great. And uh, what do you think are the essential qualities of an excellent research scientist? That's an excellent question, by the way. And of course, if you ask every, any scientist, uh, every scientist has their own list of, you know, uh, 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 suggestion for essential qualities. So, in my personal opinion, uh, here is some of the uh, uh, qualities that come to my mind. Mm -hmm. One, uh, motivation and passion mm -hmm. and interest with what you are doing. I think that this is one of the very important aspects. One has to be motivated and really 
passionate about the, the topic that the, uh, one is working on. Two, uh, we partially talk about that in our, your previous question, curiosity. I mean, I think scientists should be curious and yes. curious genuinely in what uh, that topic uh, uh, that the science is working on. So curiosity and interest is in curiosity-driven research, as we talked about. Uh, number three, in my opinion, is the time management and efficiency. Uh, one has to be uh, efficient in time management, particularly in this day and age that you uh, do parallel processing. I mean, you do a lot of, you know, uh, projects all in parallel. So time management and efficiency is important. Then uh, 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 another aspect, in my opinion, is also very important, is the connections among different fields and analogy among the different fields. This actually I find quite fascinating. For example, uh, earlier uh, discussed about this issue of, you know, for example, connection between the optical uh, physics and, you know, the biology of visual system, for example. I mean, this connection is quite fascinating. And sometimes when we go from one field of research to another field of research, all the knowledge and the tools that you have developed in one field can be quite useful and fascinating in the other field. In fact, you bring a very interesting mindset to another field. And often you can actually solve a problem from completely different angle and new mindset. So I think the analogy and connection among the fields are very important. Another quality, uh, I think learning, 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 always learning new things. I think we are always a student for the rest of our life. We always learn. And yes. I think that makes it quite exciting. Finally, uh, and this goes without saying for any scientist, is that courage. You have to have courage in doing new things. Mm -hmm. In other words, when you are in the forefront of the topic, you know, uh, and that's what the advice I always give, you know, to uh, uh, young scientists, uh, early career scientists and, and students that, you know, have the courage, I mean, to go in the field that you will be in the cutting edge and forefront of the field and, and bring up, you know, new, new items and new discoveries there. Okay, very good, thank you. And uh, could you give a few names that have big influence on you in your life and why? Okay, uh, uh, thank you for the question. That's a good, very good question. Well, on the personal side, my family, my wife and my two children have been big influence on me and my work. Okay. Uh, on the professional and scientific side, uh, I can mention several names. Uh, my uh, thesis supervisor, when I was graduate student at Caltech, uh, Professor Charles Pappas of Caltech, mm -hmm. uh, had a major influence on my way of thinking as a scientist. I mean, he taught me uh, how to do science and how to be courageous to go after new things in science. Now, uh, so uh, if I can think about other, you know, influences, uh, well, in addition, you know, uh, I remember when I was a graduate student at Caltech from uh, 1978 to 1982, uh, there were uh, highly influential scientists at, at that time at Caltech uh, that you would see them, you know, walking on campus, you know, and there were uh, they were doing great uh, work, and uh, they were very inspiring, I think, to all the students, you know, uh, at that time. You know, people like, you know, Richard Feynman, you know, Kip Thorne, you know, Max Delbruck. These were, you know, all the giants, you know, in, in physics and uh, biology and so on, that in those days, you know, uh, you know uh, we, we used to see them, you know, on campus walking, so they were very, you know, inspiring to all the students. Finally, if you allow me to suggest also names from the historical figures, not necessarily the ones that, you know, uh, we saw them, you know, in, in real time, but the historical figures uh, in the past uh, uh, have been very inspiring to me when I was reading about the history of their lives. I can mention, you know, Nikola Tesla, uh, Michael Faraday, uh, uh, Louis Pasteur, even though uh, Louis Pasteur's field is very, was very different than my field, but nevertheless, I think, uh, uh, his, his life and his passion for science uh, uh, was very inspiring. So when I was reading the history about those uh, uh, historical figures, they were quite inspiring. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. And uh, 
Uh, at first, now you mentioned your wife and then your children. So I just wonder how do you balance your life and your work? Very good point. So as I mentioned, you know, uh, one of the items is the time management. So <laughs> it's yeah. important that they uh, always have, you know, a good balance in life. I think balance in life is very important. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, spending time with the family, uh, I mean, uh, it's extremely important. So, yes, it's, uh, I, I advise to uh, all the early career, you know, students that, you know, make sure you spend time with your family. Yes, you're very busy. You have a lot of, you know, projects and so on going on. But it's extremely important to also spend time with the family. So that, that balance is extremely important. Great. Wonderful. And uh, my last question is that, do you have any suggestions or tips for the young students who are just starting their scientific research? Uh, uh, yes, actually, I think uh, uh, the message is uh, simple. Uh, go after your passion in science. Mm -hmm. Go follow what excites you in science. I think that's very important. As a scientist, you know, work is joy. I mean, when when we do research and you like the research you do, that's very joyful and it's very important. So my advice is always go after your passion in scientific topics, whatever that is, follow that passion, follow what excites you in science. And uh, I've, I've seen it, by the way, in many examples of the people I've known that if you're interested and you love the subject, scientific subject that you're working on, you will do great in it. I mean, without a doubt. I mean, uh, you spend time in it, you're motivated to do it, you're passionate about it, and you go and do the job regardless of what topic it is in science, as long as you're interested and you're excited about it. Yeah, it's very important. Okay, so thank you, Professor. Thank you very much.我们应该意识到，这些都是几千年来科学家不断发明创造带给我们地球人的福利。同样，相对于浩瀚的宇宙，我们的认知还很有限，还有诸多问题亟待解决。奈奈，你该和教授在本期访谈中与我们分享了超
。由于成就卓越， 2 0 1 6年和2017年，他分别荣获了芬兰阿尔托大学、德国斯图加特大学和乌克兰国立技术大学哈尔科夫理工学院荣誉博士学位。他还是美国国家发明家科学院院士。本期我们非常荣幸邀请到应该特教授，通过网络视频采访的形式，来了解他对于超光子学、极端材料平台上重组的工作，以及参与各类学术组织在面对科研难题时如何解决等一系列问题的看法。现在，让我们一起走进 I Can X Story， 遇见大师，分享智慧。Thank you, Professor Ngega, and thank you for accepting our invitation to join this interview. It's really my great honor and pleasure. So okay. let's start our interview. Okay, very good. So you go ahead, tell me. Okay, your research activities span a broad range of areas, including photonics, metamaterials, electrodynamics, microwaves, nano optics. Imaging and sensing inspired by eyes of animals, etc. So, how are these similar eye-related specific subjects related in your work?、Uh, thank you so much. First of all, uh, uh, thank you very much for your kind invitation to me to participate in this interview.、Uh, it's a pleasure and honor for me to be、uh, here and to participate in this interview. So to answer your question,、uh, I say that you know I love physics and engineering of waves, particularly electromagnetic and optical waves. And in my group,、uh, we have been exploring various different material platforms、uh, to manipulate and tailor waves and fields in order to find、uh, new functionalities and novel concepts. And、uh, that's why、uh, my research interests and activities span、uh, various areas, as you listed. So, as you can see,、uh, all these areas have common threads, which are waves and manipulation of waves. And that's one of the areas that I'm so interested in. This. So, any areas that involve waves, I get interested in that to see how we can actually come up with interesting functional.、Mm -hmm. Great. And、uh, what does your research mainly focus on now? What is the future trend? Excellent. As I mentioned,、uh, we are very interested in、uh, exploring how the、uh, specialized material, metamaterials, and different forms of material can help us to uh, uh, get uh, interesting functionalities、uh, from waves. So one of the areas that、uh, we have been very interested in and working on, and on Friday I talk about some of that. Uh, is the area that they, can metamaterial be used in order to do analog computations? In other words, can we actually do computation as the wave goes through materials? So essentially, materials becomes like、uh, computing machines, if you will. So、uh, this is、uh, uh, we are very excited about this area because it has several interesting, you know, features and、uh, potential applications. And other areas uh, uh, is that、uh, we have been working extensively over the years is the area of uh, uh, material with near zero index properties.、Uh, these will provide a quite a fascinating uh, uh, phenomena in wave physics that can have interesting functionalities, various aspects, including wave-based devices and components, uh, quantum phenomena, uh, thermal radiation properties, and so on. And the reason for that is because if you are dealing with a material with near zero index,、uh, refractive index,、uh, that in that material the wavelength would stretch, and as a result the phase distribution along the entire material becomes, you know,、uh, more uniform, and that gives rise to a series of fascinating uh, properties, uh, some of which. Uh, I will discuss、uh, on Friday. In general, we are very interested in the extreme scenarios in light matter interactions, and these extreme scenarios can involve, you know,、uh, extreme in、uh, degrees of freedom, extreme in processing at the nano scale, extreme in the material parameters like near zero index properties, and so on. Uh, and uh, I'd be more than happy to、uh, discuss any specific point of view if、uh, you are interested. Great, thank you. And、uh, 
I know that you have started and worked in Iran and the United States, and also you had collaborations with colleagues in Finland, Germany, and Ukraine. So what are your impressions of the universities or research institutes in these oh. countries? Okay. Yeah. Then thank you for the question. Uh, uh, I have had collaboration with uh, many scientists from all over the world. Uh, uh, and uh, as you mentioned, including various uh, different countries. And uh, I found that the research institutions and universities uh, uh, in, in all over the world, uh, they are similar uh, to uh, uh, universities uh, in the United States. In many aspects, uh, scientists there are doing world-renowned uh, uh, research. They conduct uh, a lot of fascinating research uh, 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 projects. And uh, as I visit, you know, different uh, countries and different universities, uh, I see that there are a lot of uh, exciting research going on there. And as I mentioned, I've had collaboration uh, with many scientists all over the world. And uh, really, I, uh, uh, this collaboration has led to a lot of exciting research uh, opportunities and possibilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. You can kick out any time. Okay, good. Well, uh, good morning and good afternoon or good evening and uh, welcome to IconX Talks. And today is Friday and every Friday we have these IconX Talks and purpose of IconX Talks to really promote the science and scientists and the connect the world through science. So really science is global and then we really want to really uh, bring the science and scientists together so that enabling uh, and promoting science. So really, my name is Jagadish, and I'm a distinguished professor of physics at the Austrian National University, and I'm also an editor-in-chief of the Applied Physics Reviews, and it's really a pleasure and honor for me to be the moderator for this evening's uh, session. And uh, really, it's a really pleasure and honor for me to really introduce uh, uh, Professor Nader Engeta, our star speaker today, and then he's an outstanding scientist and then well, world-renowned scientist. And we're really honored to have him today at this iconic talks. Professor Engeta has done his bachelor's degree from University of uh, Tehran and then came to US and then uh, did MS and PhD from Caltech. And then he has been the professor at the University of Pennsylvania and uh, for, for a long time. And then he's currently a uh, Nadil uh, Ramsey professor of electrical and systems engineering. And he's also professorships in physics and astronomy and uh, bio bioengineering, and as well as also material science and engineering. He's world alone in the field of photonics and optics and electromagnetics and uh, metamaterials and graphene photonics and uh, multiple fields, and he's really done pioneering work. He's also my good friend, and I'm also really honored to have him today. And then uh, and his contributions are really absolutely phenomenal. And uh, he has won many awards and recognitions, including a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors, and IEEE, and OSA, APS, SPAE, and AAAS, IOP, URSI. And he has won multitude of awards from various parts of the world, a Newton Medal from Institute of Physics in UK, and Max Born Award from, award from OSA, and an IEEE Nanotechnology Pioneer Award, and then IEEE uh, William Stryfer Award, and then SPAE Gold Medal, and then he won. He has received three honorary doctorates from Aalto University and Stuttgart University and National Technical University of Haku in Ukraine. Uh, so really, it's really a pleasure to have him and uh, here today, and then it's going to be an exciting day for us to really listen to Professor Nader Engeta on uh, the meta metaphotonics. And we also got uh, our panelists, Wei Li, uh, Professor Wei Li, and then also ex-challenger, Dr. Jin Tang, and we'll come back to them later. And then please join me in warmly welcoming first Professor Nara Engeta for really giving this wonderful talk today and at the early morning for him. And we really appreciate Professor Engeta for joining us today. And we're very much looking forward to your talk. Over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Jagadish, for your kind and generous introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor for me to be here today. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Alice uh, Zhang, Professor Chenopati uh, Jagadish, and Professor Paul Weiss, and their organizing committee for the great efforts in uh, 
uh, organizing this uh, series of talks and uh, for the kind invitation to me to present the talk today and to participate in the panel discussion. It's a pleasure and honor for me to be here together with Professor Alice Zhang, Professor Jagadish, Professor Wei Li, and Dr. Jean Tang. Also, I'm very thankful and grateful to all of you for providing this international forum uh, to discuss science all over the world, uh, which is particularly important uh, for the young generations of scientists and technologists and early career researchers in uh, various fields of science and engineering. It's very important for early career scientists uh, uh, to be discussing and talking with various scientists all over the world in various different fields of technology and science. Let me share my screen. Uh, So uh, in this talk today, I'd like to present an overview of some of our work in the area of metaphotonics, um, in which we explore how the notion and concept of metamaterials, in particular extreme metastructures, can provide interesting light matter uh, interaction platforms, particularly for manipulating waves in order to achieve uh, interesting and exciting functionalities. Uh, uh, in my group, uh, we are working on the various different research topics and research programs, uh, most of which relates to interesting uh, extreme scenarios of light matter interaction. But in the interest of time, today I will choose two research topics, which I will talk about. But first, let me first give a very brief, quick description of what metamaterials are. We all know that light matter interaction is governed by the laws of electrodynamics, both classical electrodynamics, Maxwell's equations, and quantum electrodynamics. And we often, in this type of interaction, would like to parameterize this type of interaction in form of a macroscopic parameters that you're all familiar with, uh, permittivity, permeability, uh, conductivity, nonlinear susceptibilities, chirality, and so on and so forth. Now, the, for materials that are naturally available in nature and like from the periodic table and the combination of elements from the periodic tables, uh, you have certain range of values for these parameters I showed in the previous slides. But the concept of metamaterial or composite material will allow us to actually come up with the uh, homogenized or, or composite material in which the material parameters or effective material parameters could have a values outside the range of values that nature has provided us, of course, physically realizable. And the way this, uh, this concept works is the following, that you start with the host medium, and then you embed them with these uh, man-made inclusions into this. And as the wave, electromagnetic wave propagates through this structure, it's going to induce electric, dipole and more magnetic dipole moments on each of these inclusions, and those dipole moments re-radiate. So for the observer sitting outside looking at this ensemble, would actually see an effective uh, permittivity, an effective permeability, an effective uh, refractive index. Now, it's one of the interesting aspects of metamaterial is uh, by proper design, you can have these effective values to have interesting range of values that would be very different than the values of each individual constituents that you have. And one of the, another interesting aspects of this concept is that you can have control over various parameters and the composition of this inclusion, whether they're metallic, they're semiconductor, they're dielectric, alignment and arrangement of these inclusions, the density of this inclusion, host medium, and last but not least, the geometry and shape of this inclusion, which play an important role in the interaction of light with matter, and particularly in the last uh, uh, several decades, the nanoscience and nanotechnology allows us to actually have very interesting control over the geometry and size of this. Now, in the past uh, couple of decades, there have been a lot of activities in the area of metamaterial. Here I'm showing some samples from different research groups all over the world, and this the page is by no means exhaustive list of this. There are, I can show you pages and pages and pages of many examples 
from many research groups all over the world that have worked on area of better material. But here I'm just showing a sample of these materials. In my group, uh, we are working on a variety of research program and projects currently. And these projects have different in, uh, aspects to them. Uh, and they deal with some of the, as I mentioned, extreme aspects of light matter interaction. These extremes can relate to, for example, uh, uh, extreme degrees of freedom and for non-periodic structure. It can relate, for example, extreme in material parameter like permittivity near zero or index of refraction near zero. It can relate to extreme in making material four-dimensional. In other words, in addition to space variation, we can also have a time variation for the material parameters and so on and so forth. Uh, of course, as I mentioned, there's no time to go through all of them, so I picked two research topics, and for the rest of my talk, I will talk about these two. So let's start with topic number one. And this topic number one, is specifically, uh, we have been interested to see how the concept of non-periodic metastructures can help us uh, to do information processing. And I'm going to explain what I mean by these terminologies. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons we have this research interest, because we have a long-term interest in seeing whether the concept of metamaterial can help us in uh, machine learning, in neural network, and in artificial intelligence in the future. Uh, but in order to get to that goal, we go step by step with a the, with the certain uh, step of achieving goals one after the other. And uh, what is the goal over here? Imagine the following. Imagine you would like to design structures consist of these elements, uh, each of these elements with the proper material, with the proper shape, and with the proper location on these elements, such that this ensemble of these elements uh, can provide you with the transfer function that you will be interested. By that, I mean this, that if you have an incident wave, an arbitrary incident wave coming to these structures, and looking at what comes out of that structure, you would like the relationship between the output wave to the input wave be the transfer function or the mathematical operation you like to have. Now, in order to achieve this, uh, we got inspiration from electronics. Several years ago, uh, I, I was uh, asking these uh, uh, simple questions that we know in electronics, we have lump circuit elements. Those of you who work in electrical engineering are very familiar with the elements of capacitor, inductor, resistors. So we pose this question, uh, can we actually have nanostructures in optics that when you illuminate it with the optical signal will behave as circuit elements, as a modular block of circuit elements? And indeed, we introduce uh, this concept, which we call it optical metatronics, and showing that with the proper material choice for these nanostructures, when you illuminate them with light, you can actually have an optical capacitor, optical inductor, and optical resistors. This actually helped us uh, to actually come up with this uh, uh, processing element. Why? Because the same way that in electronics, when you start with this circuit element, kind of like an alphabet of a language, and you put these alphabets together and you can have, for example, electronic processor, we ask ourselves this question. Now that we have nanostructure that behaves as optical uh, circuit elements, can we actually design material structures such that it can do information processing for us? So about seven years ago, we came out with this uh, uh, proposal uh, that uh, can we actually design materials such that as you send the monochromatic wave with the arbitrary profile into this structure, by the time the wave comes out, obviously it has a different profile. The relationship between the profile of the output wave to the profile of the input wave, can we actually make that relationship any transfer function we like. For example, we came out with a recipe how to actually design a material that as you send a wave through this, for example, it would take the spatial derivative for you of the, uh, of the profile of the arbitrary wave. And or another recipe we came out to how we can, for example, do the second derivative, spatial derivative or integration and so on. So in other words, we were suggesting that to actually have a material that can do mathematics for you as the wave goes through this. One of the reasons we were interested with this idea was uh, uh, this one of the interesting potential application of this idea in image processing. 
So in that theoretical paper seven years ago, we proposed a recipe how to actually design a structure with a thickness about one wavelength uh, with the uh, distribution of inhomogeneous material over here, such that as you send the wave to this, you would actually get the second derivative of the profile of that wave. Now, why we were interested in second derivative is because, as you know, in the image processing, the operator of Laplacian actually is an edge detector. So we were saying that it would be quite fascinating to actually have a meta structure, meta surfaces that can actually pick up the edges of the image in an analog way. So please note that there is no digital system over here. This is entirely analog, works on the wave and in the parallel system. After this theoretical paper came out, several groups actually experimentally shown that indeed it's possible to actually design uh, meta structures that can take the derivative. So we were very excited that our idea actually uh, can be expanded into uh, interesting aspects in the image processing. So as a result of this excitement, we said, okay, let's put our goal uh, at a more ambitious goal. Then we asked the following question. Now that we know that we can actually design a material that can provide you with the mathematical operation of your choice as the wave goes through this, would it be possible to design material that can solve mathematical equations for you? In other words, let the wave do the job of solving equation for us as the wave goes through the specially designed materials. So we decided to look at the, one of the most general uh, uh, linear integral equation known as Fred Holm integral equation of second kind that you see on the screen over here. As you know, in this type of integral equation, the function i is an arbitrary input that you have. The kernel k is given to us, and for any arbitrary i, the goal is to find the solution to this integral equation, which is function g. Let me make two points over here specifically. This kernel k I would like to emphasize that this kernel K is not shift invariant. In other words, the argument of this kernel is not Y minus Y prime, is Y and Y prime. This is very important because if it was Y minus Y prime, then you could use convolution. But we didn't want to go through the easy path of convolution. We wanted to actually try to solve a tough problem and so on. So this kernel is not shift invariant. And also the two limits of this in the, is an, could be arbitrarily uh, given to us from A to B. How do we go about designing a material structure, a photonic material, such that when you send an arbitrary function wave into this, it spit out, by the way, the solution uh, G. So we have to do two things. We have to design a structure over here that can actually provide this integral operator for the kernel K. That we know how to do with the previous work that we did. Uh, in designing mathematical operation. And another thing, we need to create a feedback system. And this feedback system would cause for any arbitrary input that you send over here, as the wave goes through the structure many, many times, what comes out of this would be solution to your integral equation. So essentially, we will have a material system that becomes analog computation machine, if you will. So uh, we have been working on two platforms on this idea. One platform involves uh, the feedback with the inhomogeneous uh, metamaterial, material. And this is the one I'm going to talk about today, mostly. And there is another uh, platform we are working on, and that is the combination of Mark Zender interferometers together. Now, my good friend, Professor David Miller from Stanford, several years ago, came up with the idea that if you actually put collection of Mark Zender interferometers together, each of them with the two degrees of freedom for the phase shifts, then you would be able to actually have a linear operator being implemented by that. We were very excited about that combination of MZI, and we said, okay, if that's the case, if we add a feedback system to it, can we actually solve equation for that? And indeed, there are some interesting you know, uh, constraints and uh, advantages for each of these two systems. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to talk about the one on the left. Uh, at the first part of my talk. So here's the idea. Uh, we need to design a metal material over here as an inhomogeneous distribution of permittivity over here, such that it will give us that integral operator with the kernel K for any arbitrary function inside. 
And then you create this waveguide feedback system that you have over here. And then you have these directional couplers that brings your arbitrary input function to your integral equations over here. And then when this thing comes to the steady state, when you look at the magnitude and phase of the field at these waveguides, those will be the solution to your integral equation. We did a series of uh, theoretical and simulation work on this. And then after that, we decided to actually do the experiment to show uh, the proof of concept of our idea. And we decided to do the experiment in the microwave uh, domain because the system would be larger so we can actually uh, test different parts of the system. So we decided to, for our experiment to choose this kernel, which is you know, just a, a large kernel. This kernel does not represent any physical phenomena. We just choose this kernel to have the, one of the general kernel we can, we can think of. This kernel, as you see, is not a shift invariant. In other words, you cannot write in this one in terms of y minus y prime. And you notice that it's complex and also is not separable. In other words, you cannot write this kernel in terms of multiplication of two functions, one of them y, the other one y prime. So using the method of inverse design from optimization, we came out with the distribution of a material over here, which as you see in this picture consists of two materials. The red one is polystyrene rexolite, which is a known material in uh, microwave uh, experiments. And the yellow region is, is essentially air. So essentially what you have over here is just like you start with a piece of dielectric and you make holes in them with the proper shape and proper location of these holes. And you notice, by the way, this is highly non-periodic. And that's one of the extreme cases I was talking about. In other words, in this case, you have a very high degrees of freedom. And that would allow us to do this very interesting mechanism of solving equations. So then we have five waveguides over here, which we use as input and output. And uh, let me show you an interesting numerical simulation of how the wave actually behaves inside this structure. And you notice, again, the nature of non-periodic nature of this is quite fascinating. And after we're sure the theory simulation, everything is working out, we design the structure. This is the rendition of the structure, and we build it. And this is the building uh, build of the structure we had, as you can see, consists of this dielectric distribution. By the way, uh, because this uh, start with the, it looks like a dielectric with the holes in them. In my group, we call this thing the Swiss cheese. We call it the Swiss cheese metamaterial that can act as analog computer, if you will. So let me show you experimental uh, results. So in this uh, picture that you see, we chose the input to be 10000. By the way, this input is not a digital input. What I'm saying over here is the waveguide number one is excited with the monochromatic signal with the frequency. This was a microwave frequency, 4.38 gigahertz, and the phase zero. And the other four ports were not excited. And the orange curve that you see over here is the input. The horizontal axis gives you the name of the waveguides, waveguide number one, waveguide number two, waveguide number five. And then you see six other curves over here, three pairs. One pair shows the theory result. In other words, what would we expect theoretically from that integral equation with that kernel and with this input, what should be the, uh, the, the, the solution to that integral equation? Real part and imaginary part shown with the red and blue for the dashed curve. Another pair is the simulation result. And that is the numerical simulation of the structure that we have designed and built in my lab. And again, the red is real part and the blue is imaginary part. And that's the thin curve you see. And finally, the pair for the experimental result. Red is real and blue is the imaginary part. And you see, by the way, all the blue ones agree quite well and all the red ones agree quite well. So this shows that, uh, that indeed this device that we built can solve the integral equations with this input. Now, if you change the input, obviously the output would be different. Nevertheless, you can see quite good agreement between the theory simulation an experiment, and if you do other inputs that you see over here, it agrees quite well. We were very excited about this, that indeed we built a material that actually can become analog computa computation machine, if you will. So with that excitement, we said, okay, let's actually again put our goal is a more ambitious goal. We said the next question. The next question we asked the following. 
is it possible to actually make a one metastructure or one Swiss cheese metamaterial, as we call it in my group, such that that single structure can solve more than one integral equation at the same time? So in other words, can we actually do parallel analog computation, taking advantage of the fact that photons can do, do not interact with each other, and as a result, we can actually have parallel processing quite nicely with this analog computation. The answer is yes, actually we did that, and you can see the detail of that in this paper. So what we did, we, came, we went back to our original idea, but this time in order to design this inhomogeneous permittivity, we have to design it such that it can do two things at the same time. If you operate it with the frequency omega one, it will give you the integral operator with the kernel K1, one arbitrary kernel, they'll say. And if you operate it with the frequency omega two, the same structure, without changing anything, the same structure would give you the integral operator with the kernel K2. And K1 and K2 are two different ones. Can we do that? Indeed, this was a very interesting scientific and engineering problem. One is to actually come up with a very interesting inhomogeneous distribution, but also from engineering point of view, how to design this feedback system that work on two different frequencies at the same time. Indeed, uh, we came out uh, with this design. Uh, we chose two different kernels, as you see in the bottom of the screen. Each one of them, as you notice, again, they're not shift invariant. They are complex and they're not separable, two different ones. And we designed this structure and indeed uh, it works. And let me show you the experimental result. If you operate with the frequency four gigahertz with the arbitrary different inputs that you put over here, this is the set of results you see. Again, you can see the combination of these three and these three. So real and imaginary parts agrees quite well for these different inputs for that uh, frequency four gigahertz. And this represents the integral equation with the kernel K1, but the same structure, same structure without changing anything except you just change the frequency of your signal. In that case, this structure solves the second integral equations with the arbitrary input as well. Very, uh, we are very excited about this. And right now, we are actually expanding this topic in several different directions. One direction that we are working on, and this is work in progress, and this is in collaboration with my colleague, Professor Firuz Aflatuni, is that we are bringing this concept into silicon photonics. So we are designing this Swiss cheese metamaterial for the kernel to be operable in the near infrared and to be operable on the silicon photonic aspect. This is work in progress. Uh, we, we will see what happens to the result of this. Another work in progress is in collaboration with Professor Albert Polman uh, from AMO in the Amsterdam and Professor Andrew Alou from the City University of New York. We are bringing this concept, instead of being inside a waveguide, we are bringing into the open optics by designing a metasurface and the semi-transparent mirror in order to actually see uh, what interesting you know, equation solving capability we have. This is work in progress and we're just about to submit the manuscript. The third uh, work in progress that we are pursuing this is the following. Since we showed that this kind of material can actually solve integral equations with waves, a natural question is that can we apply it to problems in physics and engineering that requires integral equation. And one of those problems in the inverse scattering problems, which is a very interesting problem, by the way, uh, and various uh, groups uh, in microwave and optics are interested in that. In collaboration with my friend, Professor Ahmed Hufar from Villanova University, we are looking at this problem to see that creating this metamaterial machine can actually help us in inverse scattering problem. So uh, the vision we have for the future in this uh, uh, topic is that would it be possible that in the future you would be able to actually have a programmable version of this type of Swiss cheese metamaterial? In other words, imagine that you can use, you know, using 3D printing or using rewritable uh, CD that we used to have in our laptop. Can we use that technology in order to come out with this distribution in homogeneous distribution of a material such that you can actually do analog computations? hopefully also with the coupling between them, so you would be able to actually do a massively parallel system. And then when you are done with that, you can actually erase that and write another one. Could we do that? So this is something that you know we are working towards that in the future. So that brings me to the end of my first 
topic that I wanted to talk about. And uh, now I would like to talk about the second topic, which is very different than the first topic, but there is some interesting commonality between them, and that is extreme scenarios. In the first topic that I talk about, the extreme scenario was the fact that the system was non-periodic and you have high degrees of freedom and you're taking uh, advantage of those high degrees of freedom in order to come out with this inhomogeneous distribution of a material in order to give you uh, those, uh, 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 those mathematical equations such that when you send a wave through that, you can actually solve the equation with waves. So it would be a wave-based, material-based analog computation. In this second topic, we're going to a completely different extreme scenario. And this scenario is when you actually like to have a material in which the refractive index would be near zero. That's another interesting scenario that I would like to talk with you about today. So let's go back to the basic. So imagine that you have a time harmonic uh, macroscopic Maxwell's equation, source-free, as we all use every day. And of course, uh, it's very well known, we teach that to our students, that if the frequency is zero, in other words, the DC scenario, static scenario, obviously electricity and magnetism will be decoupled, as we know that. Uh, but you can ask an interesting question. Uh, since you can actually design metamaterial with the desired values of the permittivity and permeability you like to have, you may I ask the following question, would it be possible to design a metamaterial such that at the frequency of your interest, at the frequency of operation, would it be possible to have the effective permittivity, the relative effective permittivity and relative effective permeability of that composite be zero. If that happens, then you notice from this expression that if you put epsilon mu zero, even though omega would not be zero, then you would still get something like this as well. So this could be quite fascinating. And uh, indeed, if that's the case, what you will have, you will have a very, very peculiar scenario. You have a scenario that from spatial distribution fields would look like static distribution, but the field from temporal point of view dynamic. In other words, it's changing with time with the frequency omega. As a result of that, because either epsilon or mu near zero, you get the index of refraction near zero, which means the wavelength in this type of structure stretched for the frequency of operation you have. And that's why uh, we call this thing near zero index electromagnetics or near zero or low index photonics. Before I go any further, I would like to make some point very clear. Uh, Sometimes when I give a talk, uh, people may ask the following question. So, oh, wait a second, if index of refraction is near zero, uh, then the wavelength is stretched and uh, then the phase velocity would be very, very high. Uh, is that consistent with causality and with uh, uh, special theory of relativity? The answer is yes, because uh, we have to bear in mind that these materials with the index near zero, they have to be dispersive. In other words, they should be function of frequency. And because they are function of frequencies and they are satisfying causality, as a result, the group velocity, energy velocity, signal velocity, they're always less than velocity of light. So everything is fine. It's consistent with the physics of causality over here and special theory of relativity. Phase velocity could be high, that's okay. But the group velocity, energy velocity, and signal velocity have to be less than velocity of light, and they are indeed the case over here. And one of the interesting points I'd like to emphasize is this phenomena that I'm going to show you, one of the, some of the interesting features of this near zero index material, it happens in the steady state scenario, not in the transient. In the transient, you have more than one frequency. So as a result, the dispersion has to be taken into account. But when we're talking about steady state, it means we reach the steady state and frequency is the one you're using. And then we're going to talk about the bandwidth and so on as we go through the talk. Okay, now, just to give you an interesting intuitive insight before I get into some of the specific aspects of this uh, near zero index structure, let me show you, let me give you a, an interesting curiosity driven question. I know, by the way, uh, uh, one of the interesting uh, uh, I'm always interested in curiosity-driven questions and to ask, you know, what if question or why not questions. 
and see what interesting physics come out of that. So let me ask one of those questions over here. Imagine that you have a parallel plate waveguide, simplest possible waveguide, with a perfect electric conductor, you know, plates, top and bottom, and inside you have air, and imagine you have a TEM, transverse electromagnetic wave, is propagating in this parallel plate waveguide. Okay, very, very simple problem. Imagine one observer sits on the left and another observer sits on the right, and the observer on the right actually measures the magnitude and phase of the transmission coefficient. Well, the transmission coefficient magnitude is one, the phase with respect to this uh, thing would be whatever it is, let's say zero. Now, I ask the following question. Imagine you break this waveguide into half, put one half of it here, another half of it there, separate from each other, arbitrary distance, and let's say you want to connect these two pieces of waveguides with an arbitrary connection that you see over here. Couple of uh, assumptions. I'm assuming that this connection still has a PEC wall so the wave doesn't escape. That's number one. And number two is that the size and the shape of this connection completely arbitrary. Now, I asked the following question. If the same observer, one sits over here on the left, another one sits on the right over here, what should the material inside this structure be such that the observer on the right and the left would think that they're still sitting over here? In other words, to these two observers, this entire region in between would be invisible to them. Is it possible? Before I give you the answer, you might say, well, how about if I use a Fabry-Perot cavity? Well, but the Fabry-Perot cavity has to have a specific size. So but here I'm saying an arbitrary size with the given frequency that we have. The answer to this puzzle is if you actually fill this region with a material with relative permittivity near zero and relative permeability near zero, then you can achieve this goal. In that case, the wavelength inside this for the frequency of operation would be infinitely long. So it means there is no phase difference between here and there. And uh, for, the, uh, for, the, this, uh, for the boundary that's normal to this, then the, uh, also the wave is matched. So the wave would go through with no phase difference over here and shows up over there. And the observer would not know that this object is there. Let me show you an interesting simulation just to give you a feel for it. So here, for example, I show the wave is coming. This is a magnetic field distribution. You notice that there is no phase difference between here and there, but the magnetic actually oscillates in unison with that frequency. And, uh, and this one is the distribution of electric field. And one of the interesting feature of this type of, uh, we call it epsilon mu near zero junctions, is that you can actually put the waveguide at any point you want. You don't need to have it collinear and you can put it at different points that you have and still works. How does that work? How did we get interested in this? In that case, let me take you back to about 15, 16 years ago. At that time in my group, uh, we asked uh, another uh, curiosity-driven question, something similar to that I just mentioned a few minutes ago, but in, in a different context. We asked the following question. What would happen if I start with this parallel plate waveguide, just like what I mentioned a few minutes ago, and I have another parallel plate waveguide over here, and these are perfect conducting walls over here. And the problem is a two-dimensional problem. In other words, everything is independent of the axis coming out of the screen. And intentionally, you notice, by the way, that I put this angle between these two waveguides arbitrary. And then imagine we ask the following question. What if we actually connect these two waveguides with an arbitrary section? Now, before I tell you what the next question was, is that what would happen to the wave that's coming over here? If I was giving this talk in front of an audience in a conference, I would ask the uh, people in the audience, what do you think should happen to this incident TEM wave that's coming? Well, the answer is that part of it is going to reflect naturally, and that's true. But then we ask this question, uh, again, a curiosity-driven question. At that time, we didn't have any application in mind. It was just a pure physics curiosity question. What would happen if we fill this region with a material with relative permittivity near zero. Are we gonna get an interesting transmission over here? Uh, one intuition in our head was telling that, okay, if the epsilon is near zero, that means index of refraction would be near zero over here. And if index of refraction is near zero in this region, that means the wavelength in this region would be very long. 
which means the phase here would be the same as the phase here. And since this is air, so you would think that, okay, because of oscillating field, you have to have radiation over here. So that means by conservation of energy, you have to have less reflection, okay? That sounds to be uh, interesting intuition. But there was another intuition at the same time, which was kind of opposite to this. And that was this. If we are inside this material and permittivity is near zero, what happens to the intrinsic impedance of the wave inside this material, which we know is the square root of mu over epsilon? In that case, intrinsic impedance of the wave here would be very high, whereas here would be the intrinsic impedance of air. So does it mean that we have a huge impedance mismatch at this boundary? And if that's the case, that means, okay, in this region, we may not have any, any wave, albeit the phase of it would be uniform, which would be useless. So because we had these two intuitions, we decided to actually solve this problem to see which one of them actually is the case in this physics problem. And uh, we got lucky because we were able to actually solve this problem analytically, mathematically, and exactly. And what you see over here on the screen, the yellow region that you see over here, is an exact mathematical expression for the reflection coefficient that you have for the wave that's coming through this waveguide over here. Let me just mention, by the way, the condition upon which we actually got this mathematical uh, expression. First of all, the waveguide that you see over here has a PEC, perfect electric conducting walls over here, and it's only open one port one and port two. Okay. Second assumption is this structure is two dimensional. In other words, everything that you see on the screen is independent of the axis that's coming out of the screen. And the third is that this wave that's coming over here is the TEM, transverse electromagnetic mode that's coming over here. And we got this. Okay, now. This is a reflection coefficient. So if I want reflection coefficient for this to be zero, I have to make sure that the numerator of this relation be zero. And this numerator consists of this term, which is a real quantity, and this term, which is purely imaginary. So let's go over them to see what they are. A1, A2. A1 is this height of the waveguide, and A2 is this height. Okay, so that means if I want this term to be zero, these two waveguides should have the same height. Okay. That's fine. But then I have to make sure that this term is also zero in order to get rho, reflection coefficient zero. But this term, which is an imaginary term, consists of uh, three terms. If I make any one of them zero, I achieve my goal. What is K naught? K naught is omega over C, velocity of light. So that means if I want K naught to be zero, that means omega should be equal to zero. So that means the DC case. That's not interesting. What that means is that if I put a battery over here, I get to see the same voltage over here. Okay, not interesting. Another term that could be possible to make zero is mu sub r. But what is mu sub r? Mu sub r is a relative permeability of this region. We already assume the relative permittivity is zero. So if I make mu sub r also zero, in that case, that means we may have an impedance match over here, and that would be interesting. But at that time, 16 years ago, 15 years ago, we didn't want to touch mu. Right now, we may actually mu equal to zero structure. But at that time, we didn't want to touch that. And there's only one other term that we could make zero. But I haven't told you what that a sub d is yet. What is a sub d? a sub d is cross-sectional area that you see over here, which means that if I make this cross-sectional area smaller and smaller, with the sh short of being short circuit, smaller and smaller, while keeping A1 the same as A2 and, and high, I would get reflection coefficients smaller and smaller. But this is very counterintuitive at the time that we discovered that. Why? What does that mean? That means if I come over here and I make the throat of this waveguide narrower and narrower, the wave actually tunnels through this better and better. Very counterintuitive. And uh, so we did a series, I mean, we, we double check, triple check everything, and indeed everything was consistent and co uh, completely satisfying Maxwell's equations. And this was very, very exciting for us. And later on, we did the experiment, which I will show you. But uh, before I leave this page, let me tell you one other interesting point, and that is what this equation doesn't show is also interesting. You notice this equation doesn't have any information about this angle. 
In other words, you can make this angle any angle you want, and still this reflection coefficient holds true. In other words, you can bring the two waveguides and bend it 180 degrees, you still get zero reflection, as you will see. So let me give you an interesting uh, simulation just to get a feel, intuitive feel for that. Imagine that you have this waveguide made of metallic structure, and you make this huge bend into this waveguide. So it's a geometric abruption over here. Now, you would think that if the wave is coming over here, it should reflect, okay? And it does, as you can see, because this entire region is air and with the metal on the top. Now, but uh, what would happen if I come over here and I put a thin layer of a material and make that material at epsilon of that smaller and smaller and smaller? Let's see what happens. If I make it 0.5, still you get a good amount of reflection, but a little bit of this leaks out. If I make it 0.1, you can see good amount is going through that. If I make it 0.001, almost all of them will go through that and with no reflection coming back over here. So it's a very interesting phenomenon, which we call it supercoupling. This supercoupling is not a Fabry-Peru uh, coupling. This supercoupling is specifically related to this epsilon uh, uh, near zero structure that we see over here. And so it's very interesting if you compare two extreme cases when there was no e epsilon material there and on, only air. And then when you put this epsilon near zero, you see three things happen. You notice no reflection. You notice that the electric field is very strong over here compared to here, whereas the magnetic field is the same. And you notice the phase is uniform there. So you might say, OK, this is, this is nice. But do we have a material that can do this? Yes, we have. Transparent conducting oxide, like aluminum dopsic oxide, gallium dopsic oxide in the near infrared has a real part of permittivity near zero. Silicon carbide in mid IR, about 10.3 micron, have a, a, a real part of uh, permittivity near zero. Uh, in, the, in, the top, in the UV regime, some of the topological insulators have epsilon near zero over here. And if you like to make your own metal material with permittivity near zero, you can actually do the combination of metal and dielectric, like um, uh, nano wires or linear structure. Or if you're working in microwave, you can actually pick up a, a waveguide, a rectangular waveguide made of metal, and you operate it at its cutoff frequency. And some of the features of epsilon near zero or, or zero index material actually is imitated by the structural dispersion. In the uh, optical regime, uh, C.T. Chen from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology suggested photonic crystals with the direct dispersion accidental degeneracy can give you effective index near zero. And Eric Mazur from Harvard actually brought that idea into the integrated photonics. So we experimentally verified that two years after we had our uh, theoretical paper uh, published uh, using the waveguide at cutoff. Here we show that indeed you can get a very interesting supercoupling with the 90 degrees bent with the 180 degrees bent. So essentially, uh, we make the waveguide looks like a wire. The same thing that you see wire in your room that you can bend it and it doesn't change the electron flow. Here you can bend this and it doesn't change the wave flow. And uh, so several years later, uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, my friend, Professor Albert Polman from the Institute of Nanophotonics in the Netherlands, we actually showed this thing also in the visible light domain. So uh, here uh, I went, visited uh, Albert for one week. And in, during that week, we designed this waveguide system, which is similar to the waveguide I show you in the microwave, but this is in, for the visible with the silver with a length of two micron and uh, with the height of this wave by 85 nanometer. And then we put that into the cathedral luminescent uh, spectroscopy device that uh, Albert has in his lab and shining the electron on top of these waveguides. And at each point, a photon is emitted. And then we collect the photons emission and we plotted uh, the distribution of a photon as a function of the wavelength and as a function of location of the electron beam. And this is for one of the waveguides we built in his lab, a 240 nanometer width. Uh, but when we make the waveguides with the narrower width, you notice that you get to the cutoff region of this waveguide. And this is an indication of the properties of the waveguide at cutoff, which is similar to the epsilon near zero property. So indeed, we showed that even in the visible domain or near infrared, we can actually have this ENZ property. 
And uh, so these can have a lot of interesting features that over the years we have been studying. For the remaining moments of my talk, which I have about 10 minutes, uh, I can show you some of the interesting features. There are many, many features that uh, we have uh, developed and we have worked on. There's no time to go through all of them. So if you're interested, please contact me and I'd be happy to send you the papers and talk to you about that. So one of the interesting things that we did is that uh, because electric field is very strong through this with no reflection, what if we use this as a sensor and kind of like an ENZ transistor? So if the epsilon here changes ever so slightly, that would change this balance. So we have a reflection and transmission. So effectively, this becomes kind of like, you know, um, a dielectric sensor device or kind of like a source drain and gate uh, system in the ENZ. Uh, with collaboration of my friend, uh, uh, Professor Yuri Kifshar, uh, several years ago, uh, we combined our interest in uh, metal material and his interest on uh, nonlinear uh, physics. We decided to actually test the nonlinearity in this type of waveguide. So he sent one of his uh, uh, member of his group, David Powell, at that time as a postdoc. Uh, so David came to our lab for a, uh, a short time, and then uh, we did this experiment, and it was very good collaboration that indeed we showed that uh, you can actually uh, tune this uh, uh, varactor over here in the microwave regime, and indeed showed that the nonlinearity of this system worked quite nicely. And uh, recently, by the way, as recent as 2016, uh, this nonlinearity has become very, very interesting in epsilon near zero material. Several groups, Bob Boyd's group from the University of Rochester, University of Ottawa, Vlad Shalayev, Sasha Volteseva, and Daniele Faccio did beautiful works, both, both groups, beautiful work on uh, in giant nonlinearity of uh, uh, indium tinoxide, and uh, also uh, our group together with uh, Luca Del Negro's uh, collaboration, we look at the third harmonic generations of that. Now, uh, as I mentioned, we looked at the various different aspects of this type of material. So uh, let me show you a couple of, uh, two or three other examples, and that will finish my talk. What kind of cavities we can have in this structure? Because the wavelength is very long in this structure, what can ca cavity we have? Remember what I mentioned with regard to that blob between the two waveguides? Essentially, what that means is even though when that blob has some geometrical size and physical size, but because the wavelength inside of that is very long, from electromagnetic point of view, it looks like a point. So what kind of interesting physics we can have in the cavity of that? So we all know, by the way, uh, that in the conventional cavity, when you have a cavity structure and you have a resonant frequency, if you change the shape of that cavity, the resonant frequency will change, which is very true. But not in this type of cavities with epsilon near zero material. So in this case, let me show you an interesting scenario. If you have a three-dimensional distribution of epsilon near zero and you put a dielectric sphere in the center of this, this structure has a very interesting electromagnetic mode. Here, we'll show you, by the way, the electric field distribution and the magnetic field distribution of electromagnetic mode inside this cavity. By the way, this is an open cavity, so the wall is open. You notice something quite fascinating, that when you sit over here, you have an electric field that's oscillating with the frequency omega, but you don't have its magnetic field there. This is one of those cases I mentioned that the electricity and magnetism decouple even though the wave field is dynamic field changing with frequency omega. And one of the interesting feature of this cavity is that the resonant frequency of this cavity does not depend on the external shape of this cavity. It's quite peculiar. So in this uh, uh, study, you show that this cavity, actually, if you gradually change this cavity to this shape and then to this shape and then to this shape. So these are not four discrete shapes. You can actually modify the shape from one to the other, we call it flexible cavities. Indeed, our study showed that in all of these cavities, the resonant frequencies stay the same, but the quality factor changes. This is quite interesting because usually in the regular cavity, quality factor is linked also to the frequency. Here, the frequencies stay the same, but the quality factor can change over here. And we experimentally verified that in my lab uh, with, the, with the microwave. Uh, in microwave domain. So we built three different cavities over here, as you see there. This blue is a cavity. So you notice this cavity has three arbitrary shapes, but they have the same cross-sectional area. 
And then we put a dielectric rod, a single dielectric rod in one of them. Now you see three of them. That doesn't mean there are three rods. That means a single rod at three different locations. And you notice the resonant frequency does not depend on these locations either. That's another peculiar aspect of this cavity. So you have three different shaped cavities and you put the rod at three different locations. You have nine scenarios over here. We built this cavity as you see in my lab for the uh, microwave frequency. And we did the experiment there. And you notice that all nine cavities shows the same resonant frequency, but different quality factor. Now, Please note that uh, these are not discrete size cavity. You can make it any shape you want as long as the cross-sectional area stays the same. Now, uh, this can have an interesting effect, by the way, in the quantum optics. So we did this theoretical study that can this material actually control the vacuum fluctuations. And indeed, theoretically we showed that using this type of material, you can actually uh, basically inhibit or reduce the vacuum fluctuation, which has a very interesting implication that if you have an excited atom inside this little blob inside this material, that excited atom, the decay of that can be controlled and slowed down. We looked at another interesting feature called the e and epsilon near zero levitations. We got inspired by the Meissner effect in superconductor in which the magnetic field is repelled. We said, okay, by duality, if we have a medium with the, a D, uh, with the epsilon near zero, that means vector D is near zero, can the vector D would be repelled, which means if you have a dipole, electric dipole on top of that, could this be levitated? We did this theoretical study and theoretically we showed that this indeed is possible. That created a lot of interest and two of my friends, Pino Strangi and Onofrio Marago, and myself are grouped, all three groups, you know, joint forces. And right now we are looking at the possibility of doing uh, some proof of the concept experiment. This is a work in progress. And finally, can this have an interesting thermal effect? Indeed, yes, because around the frequency for which the epsilon be near zero, that means the wavelength is stretched. And when the wavelength is stretched, that means that you can have a uh, spatially partial coherence. Now we know, of course, in thermal radiation, thermal radiation is incoherent. But if the material has the E and Z property, can we make the thermal radiation partially, spatially coherent? This was the uh, idea that uh, we have uh, pursued and, uh, and we did this theoretical study. And indeed, we showed uh, theoretically that it's possible to actually have a thermal radiation uh, that would be uh, directive. In other words, basically you can make the uh, object thermally behaves kind of like a phased array uh, antenna. So here, let me show you some of our theoretical result and then uh, we come to the end. So here you notice that, you know, the, the amount of uh, radiation that you see from here is more pointed in the direction. So by changing the shape of the object, you can actually control the thermal radiation. So these three cases that you see have the same cross-sectional areas, but if you study you know, the, uh, the, the radiation or, or absorption, either way by, by uh, uh, reciprocity would be the same, you notice that they have different direction. And uh, finally, the most recent uh, finding is uh, uh, one of my collaborators, uh, Dr. Inigo Liberal, who was a postdoc in my group and now, He's on the faculty of the uh, Public University of Navarra. He came up with a very interesting observation. He said, there's an interesting connection between near zero index media and ideal fluid in fluid dynamic, because both of them actually have similar interesting uh, connectivity for the pointing vector. So if you compare the pointing flow of the optics in the epsilon near zero, ep epsilon mu near zero medium, as you see on the top figure, and you compare it with the optical flow in the regular dielectric, you see there's a huge difference between these two. You notice that the optical flow in the epsilon mu near zero is actually very nicely and smoothly flowing, whereas in the regular dielectric, you can have vortices that you have there. This can actually provide a very interesting connection between fluid dynamics, ideal fluid, and electrodynamics with the near zero index material. And we have some interesting ideas that we'd like to pursue with regard to the, something like a Bernoulli's law and effect of that in electromagnetics. So that brings me, by the way, to my summary.
sheet. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you uh, and organizers and all the audience uh, for your uh, kind invitation and uh, for giving me the chance to give this talk today. And uh, it's been a pleasure and honor for me to be here, and I'd be happy to answer any question uh, you have. Thank you all very much. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor Rangeta, for such a beautiful talk. And uh, so really, it's been very fascinating and, and inspiring for all of us. And uh, it's really an exciting talk. And then you're really doing absolutely pioneering work. And uh, generally, in, in these talks, and we get uh, multiple uh, requests uh, the, in terms of questions, and then we typically restrict them to three because of the fact that we want to have some panel discussion about the general issues as well. Sure. So the first question is, Professor Engeta, amazing talk, really out of my mind what metamaterials can do. I am wondering if we can make the materials work as metamaterials machine and how to deal with the defects. In other words, can it be mass scale as production or just a small scale which can be controlled perfect? Uh, thank you very much for the question. Very nice question. Uh, our goal uh, is to actually make this thing uh, uh, in such a way that you can actually use it you know, for different purposes. Now, with regard to the defect, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, please note, by the way, that when you actually design this structure, uh, I'm talking about the first part of my talk, and we're using metamaterial to do analog computations. Part of the uh, uh, possibility of imperfection of making the material can be also included in your design objective functions. So in other words, uh, when you actually do this inverse design to come up with this inhomogeneous distribution, uh, one of the interesting points about the inverse design is the distribution of this kind of uh, dielectric constant that you get is not necessarily unique. It will give you the kernel that you want, but you can have different shapes that will give you the kernel, which means what? Which means you have high degrees of freedom, which means there are other parameters that you can actually introduce in your inverse design. For example, uh, can we actually add certain bandwidth that you want in this design? Can we add, for example, some possibility of imperfection in the things? Indeed, yes. In, in our analysis, for example, particularly for the silicon photonics that we are doing now with the collaboration of my colleague, we have to take into account that what would happen if in the nanofabrication of silicon photonics there would be a variation, how much that would affect the effect. So that type of uh, uh, analysis can be taken into account. But our goal is really to look at this as a possibility in the future to have mass scale production of this. And the, one, one other comment I'd like to add is that I didn't get a chance to go through the, some of the detail of that, but it turns out that when you design this type of analog computing machine, if the Q of your system is not that high, actually that would give you more flexibility in imperfection. And that's one of the reasons, by the way, you saw that in our design, we also have some absorbers on the end. That actually would make the system to be more flexible from the point of view of this imperfection. The reason for that absorber is we wanted to actually make the kernel we want, but indirectly also it helped us make the system faster in finding the solution and also uh, the imperfection. Thank you. Uh, and let me go to the next uh, talk, next uh, question. Uh, Shin Shin from uh, USTC. USCTC and Professor Engeta, thanks for your wonderful talk. The near zero index materials, it is really exciting topic. Could you please give some comments for the newcomer in this field and what kind of applications? Uh, thanks very much for the question. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, this field, by the way, uh, has, has grown to so many different directions, by the way. In fact, literally, you know, in the past, the four or five years, every year there have been review articles, you know, coming out for this. So uh, uh, I think it would be very exciting for you to get into this field. Uh, it, it, it's a fascinating field. There's a lot of possibilities still in front of us, both from quantum uh, physical aspect uh, and also from wave physics aspect. And I think the applications, you know, uh, coming out literally uh, every, every short time, new application coming out. A uh, lot of interesting possibilities, by the way, in quantum system. 
Uh, interesting possibilities, for example, for a thermal aspect, as I mentioned. And uh, in fact, just recently, I think it was two weeks ago, uh, my good friend, Professor Aswad Rahman from UC UCLA had a very interesting paper in science about the thermal uh, radiation of, uh, of the epsilon near zero material. So it's a fascinating field. Uh, uh, it's a field that is growing very rapidly and get into that and contact me. I'd be happy to send you some of the review papers and so on. So to get you started. Thank you, Navat. And let me go to the next uh, question. And Professor Engata, great talk. Is it possible to create a universal equation solver using metamaterials? What are the challenges in creating a universal solver? Uh, uh, thank you for the question. Um, uh, the short answer is I don't know yet whether that would be possible or not. Uh, but let me, let me rephrase your question slightly differently. I don't know about universal equation solver. If I assume by that you mean any possible equation that that system can do. Uh, so far, what we have shown is that uh, we can show, we can solve the linear integral equations. Now, but then what would happen if I change the kernel? Well, that's one of the reasons that we are interested also in the programmable aspect of this. In other words, phase change materials and those type of things. Because if we can actually change the materials in real time, then you can change the kernel, then you can change the equation, and then you would be able to solve that. That's one direction. By the way, I didn't talk about the other platform we are working on, and that is MZI platform, much in the interferometer. The advantage of that platform is you can actually change you can actually change the kernel of the equations. However, there's so many other interesting possibilities in front of us, and that is nonlinear equations. We haven't, I haven't talked about that over here. One of the uh, projects that we have is to actually bring nonlinearity into these structures. What would happen if I bring nonlinearity into this? Would it be possible to actually, uh, in the future, would be able to do nonlinear equation solver? That certainly would be our hope. And that actually connects to our longer term goal. And that is, can we use this thing in neural network? Can we use this thing in machine learning and so on? So uh, I'm, I'm optimistic. Let's put it this way. Whether we can do a universal equation now, I don't know. But certainly, we are working towards uh, programmable and changeable things in the future. OK. Thank, thank you very much, Nava. And then uh, could you please join all of you, join me in thanking Professor Navarangita for giving such a fascinating talk and answering those questions in a very thoughtful way. And uh, yeah. thank you very much, uh, Professor Angeta, for such a beautiful talk. So thank now you. let me move towards, uh, thank you. And uh, let's move towards uh, uh, the uh, panel discussion. And uh, so our panelist today is uh, a rising star, Professor Wei Li from uh, Changchun Institute of Optics and uh, Fine Mechanics and Physics of the Chinese Academy of Sciences in Changchun. And then uh, Professor uh, Wei has done his uh, PhD from Vanderbilt University in Jason Valentine's group, and then did postdoc in Stanford University in Shanghai Fans group. And then he has published his papers in Nature, Nanotechnology, Nature Materials, and Science. And then he has won many awards, including Mine Young Scientist Award, Outstanding Overseas Student Award. And uh, really, he's a rising star in the field of uh, uh, optics and metamaterials. And uh, we warmly welcome our panelist, Wei Li. And also, we've got our challenger. And uh, this is Dr. Jing Tang. And then she's a research fellow at Stanford University in Yu Chui's group. And then she did her PhD in Quran University and then gone off to MIT and Harvard and did her postdoctoral fellowship between Bob Langer's group at MIT and then uh, Dan Kohane's group at Harvard University. And she's another rising star. And then she has been identified by the MIT Technology Review as the 35 under 35 for 2020 in China. And then she's considered as a TR 35, one of these rising stars. So please join me in warmly welcoming our challenger, Jim Tang. Uh, and then now, of course, we got our panelist. And then now let's uh, maybe, we generally give the opportunity for the challenger to ask the first question. And then maybe I'll ask Dr. Jim Tang. Uh, can you please uh, go ahead and ask the question, uh, Jim, please? Yeah, thank you uh, so much, Professor Jagdish, for your kind introduction. Thank you, Professor Angita, for your wonderful talk. 
Professor Angita, since you are a very established professor in metamaterials, my first question is more about your thoughts on AI. Current computers are simply information storage and processing machines, and not truly artificial brains. What are your thoughts on how metamaterials can contribute to the development of artificial intelligence? Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Tang. First of all, uh, I, I want to thank my friend, uh, Professor Jagadish, uh, for uh, moderating this panel. And it's a pleasure and honor for me to be on this panel uh, with uh, Professor Wei Li, uh, Dr. Jin Tang, and uh, Professor Jagadish. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the question, Dr. Tang. Actually, uh, uh, that's a great question because in some sense, partially I answered that in the, in the previous question was mentioned by one of the audience. Uh, I'm very optimistic, by the way, about the role that metamaterials can play uh, in the artificial intelligence and, uh, and development of uh, that aspects of uh, science and technology. Why? Because uh, optics has always been a fascinating uh, uh, entity in order to do information processing. Going back to basically the standard convex lens that we do Fourier transforming for you, you can imagine that uh, you can have a lot of possibilities for uh, developing the field of metamaterial in order to control light and to control light in order to do information processing. However, here is an interesting point, and, and that, that's what uh, it makes uh, uh, the, one of the reasons that makes the field very exciting, and particularly for young generations like yourself getting into the field. It's a very exciting time, by the way, to get into the field. And that is, there's still a lot of interesting things need to be done. Nonlinearity is one of them. And uh, we all know, by the way, that nonlinearity is weak in optics. Uh, and uh, whereas nonlinearity is strong in microwave. And uh, I came from microwave background. So uh, I'm always fascinated by the connection between microwave and optics. And see what in microwave nonlinearity has done. Diode, varactor, all of those, those are, you know, off the shelf. I mean, you can buy them and do a lot of interesting things happens in microwave. So I'm very optimistic that the metamaterial can really open the door to uh, enhancing nonlinearity. There's a lot of interesting work going on in metamaterials community by various groups on enhancing nonlinearity. When we actually enhance nonlinearity to the level that could be quite high and not the, not the one that's naturally available in nonlinear optics these days, then you can see the effect is going to show up in AI, in artificial intelligence, in neuromorphic aspect. Uh, because one of the interesting aspects of biology, by the way, and I know you are very familiar with that, is in biology, nonlinearity is very high. I mean, I always like to give this example when I teach a course, is that look at your auditory system. Our auditory system can hear uh, mosquitoes, you know, uh, working, and can also hear, you know, a, uh, I mean, big, you know, noise. That's it. So how does that work? It's, it's a very interesting game control and nonlinearity that happens in that. Look at the way our brain works. A lot of nonlinear process in the electrical circuitries that's going on over here. Now, if we can do that in optics and create such a huge nonlinearity, that would be fast and huge nonlinearity. You can do a lot of fascinating things there. All the nonlinear dynamic, all the artificial intelligence, all the neural network, and they're going to benefit from that. So I'm, I'm very optimistic there. And I think this would be very interesting directions of the field. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Angita. Uh, for my last question, I want to ask for your advice. One of the challenges for me is to find a new research direction for my future lab. Therefore, I'm wondering, how do you advise your students to find their new research direction to differentiate themselves from you? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. That, that's a very good question. Um, in general, uh, in, I mean, one of my philosophies, and we, I, I briefly talked about that in the, in the interview that I had the other day, uh, is that it, it, in my philosophy in science is that follow your passion and, and, and interest and motivation in the field you want to do. And inevitably, you're going to find 
your own you know, path and your own interest there. Another thing, by the way, is in fact the forums like the one we have right now. I mean, when you're actually uh, seeing you know, what's going on in the science in different parts of the world and so on, what are the hot topics that's going on, different parts of that, you begin to see you know, different interesting you know, things that's happening there. But also another advice uh, I have you know, for the early career is that always look at the connection between different fields. And, and interesting ideas always come in the connection between different fields, you know? And I've done that in my own career, by the way, you know? I got interested in biology of visual systems, you know? Uh, and look at some of the, how the photoreceptors of the eye behaves, you know, when the light gets there and so on. And then uh, you can bring uh, some of your uh, uh, interest from the field that you studied to the, another field and you have a very unique view for that. This is always interesting. Sometimes you notice actually in the history of science and engineering that when someone goes from one field into another field, it can actually bring interesting view and mindset that would be different with the, for, uh, with, the, with the mindset of the people who have been working on that field for some time. So this type of cross fertilization between different fields can actually give you a very unique and specific direction that you can choose for your career. And uh, so uh, you can do it. I'm sure you, you have uh, ideas looking at the different fields. Go after the field that you're very interested in. And also, uh, uh, when you gain knowledge about other fields, you say, oh, very interesting. For example, this idea of that field can be applicable you know, to another idea of the other field that, to come up with a very interesting you know, uh, novelty there as well. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Professor Angita. For my next question, I want to ask you about uh, how your work might impact biomedical research. You know, I'm very interested in biology system. As a junior material scientist, I'm always thinking about how to create new materials that contribute to human health. I'm particularly interested in uh, potential applications of uh, metamaterials to brain science. I'm curious to hear what ideas you might have in that connection. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, let me answer that question in two parts. One, uh, the role of metal material in that aspect, but also let me give you uh, 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 another answer that relates to my own experience, not necessarily from metal material, but from other type of other aspects of my research interest. Let's start with number one, metal material. So whenever you can actually control light or waves in general. By the way, one thing I, I, I have to emphasize and I forgot to mention, every, the concepts that we were talking about metal material in my talk and also right now, of course, we're talking about electromagnetism and optics, but there's a lot of work going on, by the way, in the metal material community in acoustics, in mechanics, and so on. So those also can have quite fascinating possibilities in biomedical sensing. And, uh, and indeed, you know, whenever you can control the waves, you can actually control them in such a way that you can use them in imaging. Uh, you can use them, for example, in uh, uh, detection, like an inverse scattering that mentioned. Uh, for example, the example I mentioned that you can design something that would show the edges of the images, you know, that could be quite useful in imaging system. If you apply that into acoustic, then you can say, okay, in that case, maybe the, the metal material can be useful in, in a sonar system, uh, particularly in some of the aspects of biomedical aspects there. So this is uh, my answer with respect to connection of metal material to uh, biomedical. However, uh, in my own experience, by the way, uh, I, I, there's no time to go through detail, but let me briefly, I mentioned, uh, it, my, my career uh, several years ago, uh, when I was, you know, associate professor uh, uh, many years ago, uh, I got accidentally got interested in the field of polarization vision. I got interested into how some of the animal species in nature can actually see polarization of light. And this was thanks to one of my good friends and collaborators at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, who now at UC Davis, Professor Ed Pugh, got me interested in that. We got the joint forces. We started looking at how some of these species can see polarization of light. That led to actually development of interesting camera system that we designed and built such that 
even the human beings can actually see the nature based on what those fishes can see with the polarization. And that opened up a very interesting set of possibilities in imaging that could be using underwater imaging. And one of the postdocs who was working with us, uh, Professor Victor Gruev, now he's a full professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and his lab actually looking at those polarization imaging for brain imaging. So it was very interesting how this thing actually developed, uh, starting from the inspiration from biology, we brought it into physics of waves, we developed camera system, and then camera system can help going back to the biology for the image. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jim Tang, for the very nice questions and also Professor Rengeta for beautiful answers. And then maybe we'll go to the next, our panelist, Professor Wei Li. And do you have any questions, Professor Li, for to Professor Rengeta? Uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Professor uh, Jagdish, for uh, moderating this session. And uh, uh, Professor Rengeta, thank you so much for this uh, fascinating talk. And uh, I really enjoyed uh, your talk, uh, uh, of course, every time since I was a graduate student. And uh, every time after listening, hearing your talk, I would have some uh, new thoughts and uh, ideas coming out. And uh, so really, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Thank and uh, I guess I have two questions. The first question is, uh, uh, as a pioneer in the field of meta uh, metaphotonics, uh, you really uh, have pioneered uh, in every stage uh, in the development of this field, uh, starting from the topics like you covered today, like this near in uh, zero index photonics, as well as analog computing uh, using photonics. So what do you think uh, uh, will be the next uh, most exciting things in the next decade, uh, in your opinion? Uh, this is my first, first question. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Lee. And by the way, congratulations for the new position as a faculty member and uh, building you. your independent group. I'm sure you'll be very successful. Um, thank you for the question. Now, uh, in, the, in the development of any field, actually, if you look at the history of science and engineering, you always see uh, the fields evolve and then get to some plateau, and then there is some uh, uh, development and then it goes develop again and develop again and then it goes like this. So there are mm -hmm. certain, you know, uh, trigger points or, or I call it iconic events that, you know, can shift the field going in that way. Yes, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the future uh, of the field is very bright. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited about this. And in fact, it's great, you know, for all of you at the early stage of your career that get, they get into this fascinating field. Um, yes, there are several things come to mind that could be the next, uh, basically, set of development. One is this area that, you know, it gains a lot of interest these days called uh, four-dimensional metamaterial. I, I mentioned that uh, we have some research right. program group on that as well. And that is what? That is that, the, uh, in addition, if you notice, m most of the, uh, not most, but many of the metamaterial research is done based on the spatial inhomogeneity of the material parameters. Mm -hmm. But what if, in addition to spatial inhomogeneity, you also temporally also vary uh, the material parameters? Uh, that introduces a fourth dimension on the material parameters and can be quite fascinating. A lot of interesting things coming out under different terminologies, spatial temporal metamaterial, four dimensional metamaterial. That can provide uh, quite uh, fascinating things, like, you know, for example, if, uh, in the plasma physics community, people were interested in that topic for different reasons. They call it uh, 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 photon accelerations and so on. Uh, and, but then now, with the photonic, nanophotonic aspects, with the metamaterial aspect, it's quite fascinating to bring this concept into this. So this certainly would be one direction. Another direction, by the way, in my opinion, is topological metamaterials. Mm -hmm. Because of advent of you know, topological uh, insulators, which won the Nobel Prize you know, in physics uh, for people who looked at the electron transport you know, in, uh, in condensed matter, that has come into various different, you know, there's a lot of work done on topological photonics. And in, inevitably, metamaterial can play a role there too. So this would be another very exciting direction to consider. Non-Hermitian uh, optics is another one that metamaterial plays a role. And also, by the way, another aspect which, in my opinion, should get more attention, but maybe has gotten less attention, is the reconfigurable or programmable material. 
I think that is another very fascinating direction that I think it should get more attention, in my opinion. Because after all, if you look at the history of computation, one of the reasons that digital computer actually became much more popular than analog computer is the fact that they're programmable. Right. That's one of the reasons. If we can make analog computers of these days, particularly with the nanomaterials and so on that I showed today part of it, if we can make them programmable, you can imagine that can open up quite fascinating directions. Thank you so much for the Ingera. And uh, I have a second question. I, I guess this question is to you and both you and uh, Professor Jagdish. As both of you are world renowned scientists and have uh, collaborations uh, uh, across the globe. Uh, so uh, I, uh, for, for me, I just started a group uh, my, uh, as a faculty member in uh, Chinese Academy of uh, Science uh, in Changchun Institute of Optics, Biomechanics, and Physics. And I'm leading a lab uh, called GPL Photonics Lab, and uh, which uh, have a team of, uh, really have a team of with uh, international background and uh, uh, with a diverse team from uh, people, uh, not only in China, but also from uh, many other countries. And we really uh, focus, uh, have a, a want to do uh, like international collaborations. Uh, so uh, what's your opinion? I guess this is for uh, Professor Ingeta and uh, for Professor Jagdish as well. Uh, like, uh, what do you think about the international collaborations? Uh, uh, of course, it is, it, as you can see, it's uh, affected somewhere, somewhat by the COVID situation. And uh, what, what's your opinion about international collaboration uh, post-COVID? Uh, okay, uh, my friend, Professor Jagadish, would you like to go first, and then I go next, or uh, either? Okay, no, uh, okay, okay. Thank, thank you. No, the way maybe I can, I can start. I'll give you a little bit of break because you've been talking for quite some time, and then you can really follow. Uh, so, yes. Lee, and very nice question and very important question. The my philosophy always has been there are no natural boundaries for science and engineering. We can work with anybody. The science language of science is universal. So I've had the pleasure of working with colleagues from 30 plus countries mm -hmm. all over the world and then benefited from those collaborations. The beauty of working with others is that uh, we are really collectively be able to really brainstorm ideas and be able to bring different perspectives to solve the problem at hand. So that really helped. I've learned a lot from my collaborators. And the important thing to really do that one is that you need to develop your own core competency first. Once you've got core competency, international collaborators want to work with you. So thereby collectively, you can really work with each other. And then thereby, we can be able to really look at a problem at hand in a in a multi multidisciplinary or a multi multi perspective way, so that you can really be able to come with the more elegant solutions than we do solving the problems on our own, or otherwise working on the problems which are very narrow because we cannot be experts in everything. So that's where I've benefited a lot, and I'm really grateful to all my collaborators all over the world. And this is really very important in science and engineering, and also it brings people together as well. And in fact, these iconic stocks are also really bring the people together through science as well. So, so that's really an exciting opportunity. I would very much encourage you to explore that and then see, you know, how you can really be able to strengthen. In fact, also it leads to, you know, you know, lead to multiple you know, publications as well. Multiplier effect is also there because you don't have to write every paper which you're working on, and then your collaborators write some papers and collectively that can lead to greater outcomes for your collaborators as well as for yourself as well. So that's why you always need to find a win-win situation for your collaborator and yourself as well. So that's important as well. I think I'll stop here and maybe I'll ask uh, my friend now that really is, is, is say his, his thoughts about it as well. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jagadish. And then I 100% agree with what Professor Jagadish mentioned. I completely, completely agree. In fact, uh, uh, it, there are several interesting points was mentioned by uh, Professor Jagadish, which I completely agree. Number one, the collaboration is always fascinating. You always learn from collaboration. And, uh, and always the result of collaboration is greater than the sum of the individual contribution. And it's always you can get something more. That's number one. Number two, you always learn from the other field when you collaborate with, uh, with you. Um, and as Professor Jagadish mentioned, you know, uh, we have collaboration all over the world with different colleagues and collaborators, different places. And I always learn from them. And I really appreciate it. That And this is one of the beautiful aspects of science. Science, as, as uh, Professor Jagadish mentioned, has no border. 
And in fact, uh, uh, when you go to conferences, it's amazing. You have friends from all over the world, all over the world. I mean, it, this, is an, um, this is one of the beautiful aspects of the science. And after all, it really comes down to people. And as always said, you know, one of the beautiful aspects that the, the job that we have, and I love my job, is the fact that uh, we get to do what we love to do, okay? Uh, uh, and also, we have friends all over the world, from everywhere. And that's uh, this amazing point, by the way. It's really, really amazing. Now, with regard to the uh, uh, point that the Professor Joyalish mentioned with the core competency, I 100% agree with him. You have your own core, and then you collaborate with others. So you reach to others, and others reach to you, and each one is just like it. you have this, uh, this center and different centers, and these centers are connected together, so to speak, and uh, you learn and you contribute. So highly, highly encouraged, and you should do that at the beginning of your career. And each one of us can tell examples of how, you know, collaboration led to interesting scenarios, you know, and I gave one example with regard to how I got into the field of polarization vision because of the collaboration that I had. Otherwise, you know, I'm not a biologist, but that actually caused me to get into that field and really exposed to very interesting science of light in, uh, in, uh, in biology. Thank you so much, Professor Inkera and Professor Jagadish. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Lee. And uh, maybe we'll ask the last question. We'll give the opportunity for Dr. Kim Tang, our challenger, to ask the last question. Dr. Tang, please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, um, P Professor Angita, I have observed that leaders and pioneers like yourself in academia are able to manage many different projects, people, and positions effectively and su successfully. How have you developed this leadership skill? What are the key capabilities you have developed to manage all your responsibilities? Uh, thank you for the question. By the way. That, that's also very important in, in science and ju just like anything else, but particularly in science. Uh, first of all, uh, I think, uh, again, I go back to this interesting point. If you love what you do, I mean, it shows. And it shows, you know, your, your motivation and your enthusiasm. And when you are enthusiastic about something, enthusiasm is contagious. Other people get interested in that too. And uh, so, so with that excitement, you can excite the members of your group. And, and then, uh, then that, that synergy is a very nonlinear process. In other words, it will add up uh, to this. And, uh, and, if, uh, and also uh, respect uh, to every members of the group that you know everybody uh, has uh, complete respect with their interest, with their contributions. Uh, to uh, give, uh, I mean, uh, absolute uh, uh, excellent credit to every single contribution every member is doing because the science is the collaborative effect. And we, uh, we have all the collaborations, as I mentioned before. Another thing is the time management, by the way. I mean, that's also another interesting point that we all face. Obviously, uh, it looks like there's not enough uh, in 24 hours. I mean, we need more number of hours per day. So it's very important to have a time management. And, uh, and, and that comes, by the way, by practice, obviously, just like everything else. And, uh, and it's very important to have a balance, by the way, too. It's very important. You know, uh, family, extremely important. Friendship, extremely important. Make sure that you have a complete balance between all of those things there. And in that case, you would enjoy what you do. You would enjoy the time you spend with your family and friends. And, uh, and, and, and when you uh, have excitement and enthusiasm about what you have, you excite the members of your group. They will be interested in what they do. They see that they, they get the full credit for what they do. They have all the, uh, I mean, uh, uh, enthusiasm. And as I mentioned, by the way, to the members of my group, uh, I, I will be always with them. When they have their own group and so on, they can always count on me and my support. You know, this is like a, a science family. I mean, uh, all this grow. And I, I'm very proud of all of them uh, for uh, what they have done uh, uh, on the, um, independently on their group and, and so on. So we keep always in touch with them. And that will give you a leadership 
quality. Now, the same thing can be applied in the, in the international level. In other words, when you are active in scientific communities, scientific societies, that leadership comes uh, from that as well. Start from your group and then grow, becomes larger and larger. But let me finish, by the way, by one thing that uh, I remember one of my professors once said. He says, when you want to actually excite people about science, First, you have to be excited about that topic yourself. <laughs> when you're excited about that topic yourself, the rest will follow. So I, I always remember that, that advice that one of my professors gave me. Yeah. Many thanks, to Professor Angita, for sharing your inspiring insights with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Okay. Th thank you very much uh, to all the panelists for uh, this uh, uh, today's panelists, uh, Professor Angeta and Professor Lee and Dr. Tang. And thank you very much. And uh, uh, and now I would like to go and then at this stage and then it's normally would have been in present in in person would have presented this certificate to Professor Angeta for presenting this iconic talk. And then we'll send this one to you, Professor Angeta. Thanks again thank for uh, and a fascinating talk and then spending the your valuable time with us and then sharing your uh, science as well as also your life experiences with our young uh, panelists as well as also the young participants in this Iconex talks as well, because this is an imp important part of this Iconex talks is to inspire the next generation and which you have really done in states. Absolutely. So then again, and then on this note, and then again, as you can see that we got, uh, you know, very top scientists in the world giving talks. And in May we had uh, Professor Nicholas Peppas from uh, uh, University of Texas in Austin, and then uh, Professor Jill Millstone from University of Pittsburgh, and Professor Zonglin Wong from uh, Beijing Institute of Nano Energy Nano Systems, and Professor Nath Rangeta in, uh, from University of Pennsylvania. In June, we are uh, planning to have Professor uh, Stephanie Lacour and uh, Professor Yan Yi Hong, and also Professor Jean Marie uh, uh, Lan and uh, then also polit Professor Political Ajian. So you can see, I hope you'll join us for the June talks as well, because really, again, these are all experts in the field and we can all learn from them. And of course, as you know, that Professor Learn is a Nobel laureate in physics, and then it's really interesting and ex ex exciting to really hear from him about uh, spintronics and then how spintronics and uh, memory technologies have played an important role in our lives as well. With that, and of course, the next talk is going to be Professor Ajian from Rice University. He's going to talk about nano-engineered materials, uh, opportunities and challenges on June 4th. And then again, we've got two uh, panelists and uh, Dr. Nick Fang from MIT. And also our challenger next week is going to be uh, Dr. Meichi Lee. And then it's uh, really interesting to see. It looks like uh, we are having uh, uh, Professor Lee's and Dr. Lee's. And also it looks like we've got a lot of Lee's as part of uh, uh, our iconic uh, panelists as well. And then, of course, we got our professor Alice Sang, and who really started these iconic talks and then really promoting the science and scientists. And we want to sincerely thank her for her own good work. And also, all her, all her team will put into the, these professional iconic talks. Thank you very much, and have a good day or good evening or good night. <laughs>